narrates the answer using your own expression. So you should avoid lifting sentences from the passage. Try as much as possible to write your answers in your own expressions. Questions that require the nearest in meaning or synonym of an underlined word or phrase should be done in such a way that you first understand the meaning of the, of the word that has been underlined and then look at the context where you find the word so that you will not make the mistake of giving a meaning that is outside the passage. Then you should make sure you are using the most appropriate word to substitute the given word or phrase. So and that is why I said the environment of the word determines the meaning of the word. Likewise, still on that uh, the issue of um, synonym or nearest in meaning, maintain the class of word you are substituting for. If the word is an adverb, you should also substitute with an adverb. You should not substitute an adverb for an adjective. Maintain the word class of the word you have been given to. Look for its nearest in meaning. Ensure that all your answers are correctly spelled and grammatically related to one another. Avoid wrong spellings while answering comprehension passages and make sure that you follow the rules of grammar. Avoid writing two answers for one question. You should not write two answers for a question. That could be confusing on the part of the reader or the examiner. So you make sure that you are very sure of the answer you are writing down before you write it down. It may actually make you lose some marks if you are writing two answers for one question. Do not give answers outside the given passage. All answers must be derived from the passage. Some students out of two know because maybe they have had a previous knowledge about the passage or the topic of the passage and they feel because they have this knowledge they can import their own knowledge into the passage. This should not be encouraged. Do all your workings in line with what you have been, in line with the information you've been provided with in the passage. So do not write answers that are outside the passage. Here is an exercise for you. It is a passage brought out from the um, past jam question. So you read through the passage and let's answer the question. says, for each of the following words, find another word or phrase that means the same and which can replace it in the passage. Now, we shall pick the word, now we'll go to the passage and find out the suitability or the wife of the word we have chosen. The first word we want to replace there is mystery and the line where that word occurs reads this way. Though Hitler is dead, Many mysteries about him remain unraveled, especially the mystery of how he was able to rise to supreme power. So the mystery here can simply be replaced by the word secret. So if we use the word secret, it means especially the secret of how he was able to rise to supreme power. So of course the word secret can properly replace the word mystery as used in this passage. The next word we want to replace is verdict. I repeat the word verdict. How is the word used in this passage? I read the line where the word occurs. Hitler's verdict on himself was given in the testament. Hitler's verdict. So if we use the word pronouncement or judgment, it can properly replace the word verdict. So let's try pronouncement. It says, Hitler's pronouncement on himself. I'm sure you see the suitability of the word pronouncement in replacing the word verdict. The next other word is astonishing. We are looking for another word that can replace the term astonishing as used in the passage. First, let us read the line where, or the sentence rather, where this word astonishing appears. It is an astonishing and revealing document. 
What about the word amazing? Surprising. Fine. Don't forget that the word astonishing is used with the ing marker. So for any replacement we are supposed to get, it should equally um, come along with the ing marker. That's the progressive marker. So it says, it is an amazing and revealing document. So the word amazing can properly replace the word astonishing in this context. Okay, the next word is detachment. So let us read the sentence where the word detachment occurs. The word, the sentence reads, with perfect detachment and single-mindedness, he claimed that he had shown the German people the way which destiny had pointed out to him, to them, and it was not his fault that they had proved unworthy of the task. Perfect detachment. The word aloofness or indifference can properly replace the word detachment. And so we read, with perfect aloofness or with perfect detachment and single-mindedness. I'm sure we have properly replaced that word as used in the passage. The next word is submit. Let's read the line where that word occurs. Hitler wrote that he chose to die by his own hand rather than submit to cowardly. The expression that can properly replace this is giving to. That's the phrase. Giving to. Cowardly abdication or capitulation. And finally, the word we want to replace here is bequeathed. The question is, what word can properly replace the term bequeathed? Now, let's read the sentence where that bequeathed occurs. But the most revealing paragraph of his testament refers to his possessions, which he bequeathed to the party. Which he bequeathed to the party. The word gave to the party can replace the word bequeathed to the party. We are done replacing words which we call synonyms or next in meaning. Don't forget that the words we have used here to replace the words as used in the passage may not exactly mean the same thing with the word replacing it, but it must be as near to it as it can be. Now the next part of the question says, that's the G part of the question, while he was dictating these words, the question says, what is the grammatical term used to describe the above expression as used in the passage? Let's put that word on the board. While he was dictating these words. Okay, let's find out exactly where it occurs in the passage. Okay, it says, while he was dictating these words, the Russians had encycled Berlin. So, this is the expression. The question is, what is the grammatical name given to this expression? And I'm sure you know that whenever you are asked what is the grammatical name given to an expression, that question simply means, under which part of speech are you going to classify the group of words? That's the question. Now, I'm sure you remember your parts of speech. The adverb, the verb, the adjective, the conjunction, the interjection, the noun, the pronoun, and what have you, about eight of them. Now, under which of these parts of speech are we going to classify this while he was dictating these words? I'm sure you know that this expression is referring to the time of an action. Now, of course, the time of an action oftentimes is an adverb. And of course, the first question that should come to your mind is this expression a phrase or a clause? That's the question. The answer is that this is a clause. Why is this expression a clause? It is a clause because of the presence of a finite verb. A finite verb is simply a verb that adjusts to the adjustment in the subject of the sentence. 
A finite verb is a verb that takes cognizance to either the singularity or plurality of the subject of the same verb. A finite verb also is a verb that is inflected for past tense. And so, the presence of words here, I'm sure you know that this is the subject of the sentence, and of course it's the singular subject. I'm sure you know that. This verb words is a past tense, it's in the past form, and of course it is singular. I'm sure you know that virtually all the verbs ending in the letter S are singular verbs. And so, we did not say he were, no, but we said he was. The essence of this word is as a result or is because of the presence of he, which is of course a singular subject. And so this singular subject agrees with this singular. The verb dictating here is not a finite verb. It is not a finite verb because it is not affected by whatever happens at the subject level of, this, of, of, of the structure. It is not affected. So even if we say while they, for instance, which is a plural subject, even if we said why they, what would change would be where we change from words to what? Where? And the dictating will remain there. So even if while was dictating, one of the two is finite, while the other is non-finite. And one that is finite is obvious. It is this. Of course, by now you should have known that virtually all the primary auxiliary verbs are finite verbs. Is am um, be. Okay, from here we have was, we have were, okay, we have been, progressive form, then we have be, and past participle of be. Okay, so these are primary auxiliary verbs. And the lexical verbs, that the verb you can act upon, the action of the verb, oftentimes may not be finite verbs, especially when they are being helped by the primary auxiliary verb which of course is part of the helping verb. So we can see that words is the primary auxiliary verb here. Hence, it is a finite verb. And the presence of this finite verb in this entire structure makes the structure what? A clause. So the question of whether it is a phrase or a clause has been sorted out. The next question is, what type of clause is it? Since it is telling us about time, why? It is clear that it is what? An adverbial clause. Now you may add a bigger clause of what? Of time. Does it make sense to you? So this expression, the grammatical name given to this expression is an adverbial clause of time. So we say the expression is an adverbial clause of time as an answer to the question. The next question is what is the function? If you identify an expression to be an adverbial clause of time, it is easy to talk about the function because more often than not, adverbials modify verbs. So the question now would be, what verb is being modified? The verb being modified would not be under, would not be within the expressions underlined. The verb being modified would have to be outside the underlined expression. So you go back to the passage to find out the closest verb. So when we read the passage, that should be the second paragraph of the passage. It says. While he was dictating these words, the Russians had encircled Berlin and the Chancery was being bombarded. So the closest verbs there are had encircled. So and had encircled is a verb phrase. It's a verb phrase. I'm sure you know the verb between the verb phrase and the verbal phrase. And the phrasal verb. But this, of course, when we have two verbs coming together, what we have the product is what the verb free. So we say that while he was dictating these words, is an adverbial clause, that's a grammatical name. The function is that it modifies the verb phrase had and circled. Does it make sense to you? We have taken care of that question. And I think that ends this section of 1990. English language comprehension passage.